in the name of the love that is always healing us and making us whole. Amen. Our scriptures this morning invite us to think about vision. We come to this culmination of Job's story, a story we've only heard in little snippets over the last few Sundays, and we certainly didn't hear the biggest, darkest, most stormy moments where Job is just being pummeled by these calamities. He's come through, though, today, we can breathe a sigh of relief, through that period of unfathomable loss, grief, and suffering, into a new and different season of possibility. Today's Gospel also introduces us to Bartimaeus, a man who we're told has lost his vision. We don't know how that happened, whether it was injury, whether it was an illness, but Bartimaeus is clear. He wants Jesus to restore his ability to see. Both men are changed as God's work in their lives becomes visible, evident to the wider community. And both of them come to see the world through the lens of renewed hope. They are given a fresh future following great difficulty. And their stories invite us to consider where we, too, come through seasons where we need help seeing God's sometimes hidden work in our lives, moving us ever onward and through those difficulties toward a hopeful future. Such spiritual vision, as we're talking about, steadies us to wait for God's work of redemption. That kind of vision is important because it shapes our priorities, tells us where to put our energy and where not to bother. It energizes us as we name what must be present for our lives to be vibrant and complete, not only now, but in the future. As the rector of St. Paul's, it is my privilege and responsibility to begin naming that spiritual vision that I see emerging in this season of our ministries at St. Paul's, so that we can ever more clearly go with confidence and compassion and courage to those places where Jesus' love is calling us into deeper participation in God's life in the world. That deeper life is powerful and present, and it shows us that our future is intertwined with the future, the hopes, the yearnings of our neighbors. Yes, with God's help, we come to recognize that mutual interdependence is always part of this way of love that the Spirit is awakening us to continue in. After all, God's own being, God's very self, is love in community. That's what we mean by the Trinity, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit, in this endless outpouring of compassion and care, moving and energizing and multiplying that gift of love. We see that here at St. Paul's every time we invest in building relationships that show forth that, that connectivity that Bill was talking about, as we root ourselves in divine love and all the things it wants to make possible in the world. Yes, this call to belong to one another, to be invested in each other, is a path of love that asks us to live in new and enlivening ways. Like the Sakai's mentioned in their sermon last week, and if you weren't here, please do see the YouTube recording of it because it was a powerful testimony. They urged us when we come to communion to see the person on our right and our left and to say a prayer of blessing, to recognize that our lives are closely linked with one another's. And I think it's a call, that's a beginning, because that call will invite us to grow curious, to wonder where God is at work in each other's lives, and where we can encourage and uplift, support, and deepen what love wants to do in us and through us. We notice, if we look around, who is and isn't present 
We go to the places where people who might not be able physically still to make it, we go to them. We bring them that glimpse of God's love and sharing communion. And we also seek who isn't here yet because they haven't yet been invited. I saw that this week, thanks to the healing team's vigil, when someone showed up who's part of our annual rummage efforts and said, somebody invited me to come. And I'm still a little unsure about how I feel about church, but this thing we're doing out on the labyrinth with a fire, with some prayers, and some space to be together with our yearnings and our hopes, I need that. I need that in my life. I didn't ask her what brought her here. She wanted to tell me. In our surrounding community, beyond these walls, God is at work transforming lives and renewing human hopes. And God calls us to see ourselves there too, in that wider circle of belonging, to listen, to tune in and turn toward the needs and yearnings that are all around us in San Mateo County. And also, yes, to work for healing possibilities for all these things that people hope. Yes, some people have said lately they aren't sure about what Sarah's vision is for St. Paul's. That's probably the topic for more than one sermon. And it isn't really my vision. It's the vision God is bringing to us in this season. But I do want to say there are a couple key contours of this vision that are becoming clear. And I think four words for me sum up those important foundational pieces. Worship, witness, compassion, and solidarity. If you're here today, you know how much it means to be uplifted by the grace of our liturgy and our prayers and the music of this amazing choir under Dr. Matthew's direction. You know what it means to be stirred by the teachings from our Christian tradition. We prize our worship life here at St. Paul's, and I am so grateful for the ways that it turns us toward the mystery of God's greater life among us. In worship, we also begin to sense our holy call to share God's presence with one another in key moments, whether they're large or small on the earthly journey, gazing up at the night sky and witnessing the miracles of creation, or being with someone as they're lamenting the loss of a loved one. We join in those celebrations in our life together here, whether it's births and baptisms, weddings and confirmations, and yes, next Sunday we have some confirmations with Bishop Austin. I hope you'll be here. These are the ways we affirm this life of God that is the sacred source of all our loves and passions. And we invite ourselves and people who belong to know it to encounter the one who loves us beyond measure. That's here, and we are so lucky to share that life together. We're also privileged and blessed to come alongside people who may be in seasons of grief and loss, just as surely as Joe went through. People who come saying, you know, I haven't been to church in years, but my mom died, and I want to honor her life. Will you help us? That kind of experience of coming alongside and saying, the church has love. We can embody that and share that with you. Your loss is our own. That's a gift that we share with others. That consolation, that peace, that comfort, whether people call this their church or not, we can share that as a gift that is multiplied because Christ, after all, showed us that the sorrows of the world were his very own. God's own compassionate heart aching with creation for its loves and losses. I think this part of the vision, where Christ's compassion involves us in the life beyond this place, is something that we're stretching into already. And there are so many people who long to feel the grace of loving community. I'm so glad that compassion is part of our long-standing DNA at St. Paul's. And that compassion deepens to solidarity every time we reach out and serve and connect with people who may not find their way into this place, people who may be suffering or on the margins or confused and, and still wanting and craving the touch of God. I'm also aware that we have this ability to raise up a 
new generation of people who lead and serve and mobilize the compassion that is in this generation, not only the people who are here in this room today, but people who want to make a difference in the world. That heartbeat is part of our future, and it's part of so many others. And with God's help and yours, we can look to orchestrate that and make that manifest more regularly and with more magnificence. Yes, we cannot do everything all at once, and we will need to prioritize but Christ's solidarity with all who suffer sharpens our sense of urgency as we seek to respond to those who are vulnerable. Whether you're contributing to a life news breakfast, or going on a Corazon house build, or coming after this service to think about the housing situation in San Mateo County, all of these are ways we listen for the Holy Spirit, daring us to follow Jesus' path loving service. God's restorative vision for the whole creation asks us to trust that as our hearts are wired to thrive through mutual interdependence, we each receive what we need to flourish through generous sharing. God's life shared abundantly with this whole world. We can make that known through our sphere of solidarity strengthening us as we build partnerships in our surrounding community, and activating us to share Jesus' love, making justice and peace for so many who long for it. This is all about what our forums are exploring this year, and I know that your voice and your connections, the things that you're noticing, are needed in those conversations. Thank you so much, Marty and Brian, for orchestrating today's opportunity for us all to be in that conversation. I believe these yearnings and hopes of our neighbors hold the seeds of future blessings and possibilities for all of us. And each of you, your passions, your interpersonal connections, your energies, your time, your talent, your financial resources, all of these are priceless and valued and essential to what God wants St. Paul's to express as we see and know Jesus' love transforming our life together. I'm grateful to someone from our confirmation class who describes St. Paul's last Sunday as a community of beautiful abundance, full of yearnings and hopes. I <coughs> like that. That is, captures so much of where we are in this moment, asking God to renew our sense of vision as we bear witness, as we turn toward our neighbor, as we connect more deeply and practice Jesus' compassion and solidarity with the whole world. These practices are fundamental to our flourishing at St. Paul's, and it's not something that I or the staff or the vestry or any of our lay leaders can do alone. We need all of us to make this vision reality at this time in our life together. We must work for that beautiful future if we wish to see it. Today's brief and powerful conclusion to Job's story that Beth read for us shows us what is possible when human beings have courage to take that first step. This comes straight from that final part of Job's story. We ask more questions, we acknowledge what we don't yet understand or cannot yet know. By practicing repentance, we turn toward God and one another. And we turn away from everything that opposes God's love. This journey of transformation will mobilize us as a community of authentic care, just like the one that encircled Job in this hopeful moment. And like Job, we can pray for people we know and those we have yet to meet. We can continue to break bread here at this holy table and in one another's homes, sharing an authentic life of love together. This is how our resources will be multiplied in ways that make others and ourselves whole. Because that restorative fortune that Job's story talks about symbolized the gold jewelry and money that the scripture says was brought not only by Job's brothers and sisters, but by all who had known this man before calamity struck. 
and he was a well-connected fellow. These were all expressions of God's own generous abundance, transforming disaster, multiplying the traditions, blessings, and possibilities of future generations. May that kind of love, God's abundant love, be visible among us at St. Paul's, renewing our hope and transforming our future. Amen.